how's everything going for you, man? It's the new single is killer, dude. Like Thank you. everything seems to be going really well. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I've really been happy with uh, how people have responded to it, how the mm-hmm. songs performed analytically and and maybe yeah. more importantly, yeah, is how people have responded to it. We've been told by so many people that they think it's really powerful and moving and it's very exciting to hear Trevor McNeven of Thousand Foot Crutch on a song, hear his voice again and to as a fan to be able to be sort of the one of the, the, the I guess the I was trying to think like the, the, the catalyst for that. Yeah. Is the only a thing that I will appreciate and recognize is how cool it is probably a decade from now. Because uh, right. in the moment, I'm just doing it and just trying to make it good. I'm not thinking about the implications of it. I mean, I can I can have a, you know, a quiet moment and be like, wow, that's crazy. But it's not going to hit until many years from now. But I'm very happy with how Imperialize is doing. And frankly, all of the singles that uh, I've been able to release over the past two years. It's yeah. been great. I'm a huge TFK fan. I have been... Right. S- I re- I told Trevor this the first time I ever interviewed him. I remember seeing Thousand Foot Crutch in 2002 at Cornerstone Festival in a tiny tent, set it off, had just come out. And wow. um, yeah, so I've been following them since the beginning. And so to hear him on this single, I got so excited because, dude, he's not doing much in the spotlight right now. Mm-hmm. He hasn't for a few years. How did you get connected with Trevor? Right. Um, well, it, sort of winding paths, uh, I'll try to get there or get to the, the destination, but, uh, the label that I'm a part of judge and jury that's working on my album right now, um, is comprised of industry veterans, uh, Howard Benson, multi-platinum okay. producing producer worked with plenty of secular bands and also contemporary Christian bands. Yeah. So yeah. everything from Kelly Clarkson to my chemical romance to Flyleaf. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. has worked with so many, uh, a couple of skillet so, albums. yeah, all a, a whole bunch of them. And, and then, um, also Neil Sanderson of three days, grace writing mm-hmm. drumming fame. Uh, so there's a lot of not just combined experience, but also, uh, six degrees of separation, the connections that they all know. Yeah. Um, and Trevor McNeven was one of those people that Howard knew. And okay. once we sort of identified that a lot of the music I was working on, starting to work on and and wanting to produce was more Christian in its nature. They started looking into their contacts and looking into people that they knew that, that would maybe be interested in working with and collaborating with a a fledgling original artist who was writing spiritual Christian music. And Mm -hmm. Trevor McNeven was one of those first names that they knew. Um, and so they, and much like with Lacey and Manifest, which are the other singles that we released, Never Back Down and Darkness Before the Dawn, they, this one was, uh, Trevor McNeven was one of the ones that were part of that group that we were looking for. And the sort of roundabout way of, it was probably going to be asked about, uh, unparalyzed creation, but we'll just, because it fits into the question you've yeah. asked about how getting Trevor, we'll talk about it now. Sure. Um, Trevor and uh, this individual, I forgot their last name, Dustin, who is the singer and one of the writers of Star Set. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A Bates, yeah. I think. I th- believe so. That that's yeah. ringing bells, but I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to stake my reputation on my memory because my memory is terrible. Um, I'm, so, I'm amazed I remember the first name. Um, right. They're pretty good friends, and oh. Star Set's gone in a very different direction with their music, but. They were mm-hmm. sharing music one day, Trevor and Dustin, and Dustin had this song, this German idea that he just had never quite worked out, never came to fruition, and didn't really fit with what Starset was trying to write moving forward. So Dustin asked Trevor, if I'm if I'm recounting this wrong, Trevor, just, just call me and correct me. Um, asked if there's anybody who might want this. Would you want this? Is this something you could take, make it your own, reimagine it, whatever you want to do with it? Is this idea something you're interested in? And then Trevor had remembered a conversation that he had had with the judge and jury team, Howard, about me. And then Trevor said, there might be a place, there might be someone I know who could take this and make it their own and really flesh Mm -hmm. it out. And that's how that conversation started for the song Unparalyzed. And that's how the connection sort of really coalesced and came together with okay. Trevor and even uh, okay. so this, like I said, the six degrees of separation is wild. And a lot of people don't know, but if you check the writing credits for unparalyzed, it's one insane. of the main people up there is Dustin from star set. Cause mm-hmm. this was his, his original germ of his idea wow. was this song. So yeah, that's how it came about with working okay. with Trevor. The credits on the song are insane. Like, mm-hmm. Holy crap. You got Cody from wage war. 
Um, right, ta- right, talk right. A little, talk a little bit about his involvement with the song. Yeah. So there's there's so much that happens with Judge and Jury, the yeah. label that I'm working with to work on this album. And they, like I said, the six degrees of separation, the people that they know, the people they work with for writing, the people they work with with producing and engineering. Um, they do a lot of this is sort of a, a roundabout way of saying sometimes we work so quickly and unparalyzed is a song that was written and finished in a month and a half. And that was due in part because a lot of the people involved, including Trevor, we had prior engagements. And a lot of times when you're working with labels in people's lives, you have to really be rigid if you're wanting something to happen as it relates to time frames. And this was one of those where we didn't have a lot of time. So sort of a roundabout way of saying Cody being involved was one of those things where judge and juries had to move really quickly, had an opportunity to work with Cody and have him be on the song and or work on it in some way to where I was not aware of it until the final days of like, I recorded my vocals. I sent everything in. I wrote the, right. wrote what I was supposed to write sent it in and they and then Cody was like on it and I was like what <laughs> in the world like how it's just one of those things they had to move really quickly and yeah. be agile with it so right. it was a it's sort of just wild I don't have the story uh, about it I have Trevor's because that was very right. much the inception of the song but Cody came along later to help with the song and, and flesh it out in a in a obviously right. a very tangible way because the pieces of this song in particular are the whole is nothing without the pieces. So yeah. uh, I'm just excited to have it. it it's really cool because it's one of the best songs we've written for sure. And a lot of people don't realize that Trevor and Three Days Grace have a connection as well. Some of the Three Days guys play uh, did some background vocals on a couple uh, TFK songs mm-hmm. back in the mm-hmm. day as well. So there's a huge connection with those guys. Like, yeah, yeah, that's another way back. It reminds me too, uh, and you'd probably be more privy to it just because of your knowledge of of TFK, that when I had a conversation with Trevor um, before the song, he wanted to chat with me, and obviously I wanted to chat with him. I'm just usually a pretty uh, anxious, nervous person. Uh, He would have reached out as the elder, and we talked for about an hour and just Nice. Learned about each other and talked about life, and he talked about the connection with Neil and Three Days Grace, and mm-hmm. uh, how cool and special that was, and how they all started around the same time, yeah. and each other then. So it, it's really, it's just wild to know how the uh, not obviously this is niche, you know, the CCM scene, contemporary Christian music is niche in its own right, but even within the greater scene of rock and roll or heavy metal or new metal or hard rock, the 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 greater community that involves all of that, the, the, the how people know each other. Uh, mm-hmm. That's been what's, that's been eye opening for me being new to this side of music, um, yeah. working with a label and doing that. So it's, it's been wild. The subject matter of the song. Like one thing I love about all of your song, all of the singles I've heard so far is musically it's freaking awesome, but lyrically, nice. lyrically it's all about something. It's not just mm-hmm. music for the sake of music. The message right. is really strong and really powerful and really important. Thanks. And Unparalyzed is exactly that. It's a really important message. And it's something that a lot of people, I feel like, think about and deal with it. But nobody really talks about it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely, there's a, there's certainly a, uh, a, a, a themes running through all of the singles that we're releasing that's coming up and working towards the the album that's coming out. And one of the themes I really wanted to get at was there's a lot of music that I listen to that's very energizing and sort of about um, overcoming obstacles and um, l- learning lessons and, and being powerful and being the champion and and what have you. And I think there's a time and place for that. And there's... And some of the music I've written, like Never Back Down, is more along that vein, too. Mm-hmm. But I really wanted to speak to my generation mm-hmm. and younger generations about the idea that sometimes we're like, you're going to be in the mud for a while. You're going to be in some really dark places, some uncomfortable places in your life. And I don't want to necessarily try to just gas you up to to get through it. I kind of want to sit with you in that discomfort. I want to sit beside you, have a gentle hand and encourage you through the darkness, through the difficulty. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily trying to, um, will you out of it. It's like, listen, this is part of the process. This is part of growing. This is kind of where we have to be. Um, 
And there will be a point. There will come a time when we need to move from this. We need to move on from whatever anxious, lonely, um, difficult difficulty that we're in. There will be a time to move on from it. But right now, if you're in it, let's just be together in it so we can work through it and come out of this alive and hopefully in a, in a better place than we were before. So that's the kind of music I'm wanting to write. And Unparalyzed really speaks to that concept. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and the, the idea, the German, the idea that Dustin had, we preserved that idea, but we really fleshed it out through the lyrics that Trevor wrote, the lyrics that I wrote and the melodies we came up, uh, came up with. So I, I'm very happy thematically with the way the album's going, lyrically with the album's going, probably lyricism maybe might, maybe my favorite thing, yeah. um, even beyond just the composition, but lyricism is something that's very important to me uh, because I, I I grew up with a dad who was a radio uh, host for 40 years. Uh, both of them were very thespian-like people, so they were in musical theater and everything. Nice. But the point I'm getting at, and my mom was a marketing advertiser, so what I'm getting at is I have been told and believed that your words are so, so important and what you say and the weight that they hold are maybe more important than anything you could do. So when yeah. I speak, I want to make sure that I'm saying things I believe in, saying things that are going to be encouraging and helpful and true. That's what I want to make sure when I speak that those things are happening. I make mistakes and sometimes I get it wrong, but at the very least, I'm I'm speaking with integrity and I'm understanding the weight of what my words uh, have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um one one thing I've really noticed, just as far as Christian rock in general, I've been a I grew up in the church. I've been a Christian right. rock fan my same. entire life. I grew same, up same. on I grew up on Petra, Striper, Bride, Guardian, man, Blood, no you know, kidding, all those bands. But Christian rock now is very different than it was back then. Back then, it was very. They talked about Jesus blatantly, openly in the music, and over the years, especially now, it's it's shifted more to you. We know that the artist is a Christian. They're very open about that in their interviews and what they say. But when it comes to the music, it's there. It's very obvious, but it applies to non-Christians as well. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the themes are still there, um, but it's not as openly talking about Jesus and God, which right. I think is great because people who aren't Christians will find it, fall in love with it, and maybe still get the message, but not be turned mm -hmm. off by all of that mm -hmm. is it important to you to kind of go that route as well like your faith is obviously breathed into the lyrics the themes right. are there but a non-christian doesn't feel alienated listening to it but still gets the message right and that's a that's a that could be its whole other two hour long <laughs> podcast if you wanted it to be because i do have thoughts on that um, it could, but... and uh, you could make a argument to say that we've had sort of two genres that have diverged out of Christian music. We have this uh, CCM, contemporary Christian music, rock oriented, alt pop yeah. oriented. That's a, a little more spiritual, if you will. It's more spiritually sure. oriented. The people who sing yes. it are Christian. Um, there are themes, there are the Christianity themes within the music, but the explicit nature of, of mentioning Jesus Um mentioning got the gospel message explicitly those aren't things that present themselves in ccm in especially in rock spaces and then in another we've diverged to where worship music has come up and it's always been around but we've really two paths have been created there's worship music and now there's ccm when before you could you would sing in church if you were in church you would sing michael w smith you would mm -hmm. sing casting crowns you would sing stephen curtis chapman and these were people yeah. in the ccm space but now we have a lot of other artists that have come out that are explicitly worship songs that write worship songs, Elevation Music, Bethel, Hillsong, the list could go on. And that's what they write, music for church. Yeah. And in some ways, the good and bad of that is you've the church experience is, is very uh, invigorating. It's, it's reassuring. It's all the things. It's the gospel message presented plainly. Um, but in other regards, it. it the 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 breaking them up has made it to where in some ways it feels like your where does your music fit in the greater music industry as it relates to streaming and the modern technology we have with iHeartRadio and Pandora where does your music fit yeah if you are writing your rock CCM music and you speak 
boldly and plainly about Jesus and the gospel because you're not going to be necessarily welcomed in the worship space because you're not going to be played in church and mm-hmm. make revenue from the sell of your music to churches. And you're also not going to be too welcomed into uh, mostly secular places because you're mentioning explicitly explicitly Jesus. Uh, so we've I think Christian music, the Christian music, the broader spectrum of Christian music has unfortunately veered itself in two directions. And I'm speaking. I want to make sure I say again, I'm speaking from a, a position of humility. I, I'm 30 yeah. years old. I don't know everything. I'm just talking right. about my anecdotal observations yeah. of what I have seen. Yeah. Um, so I don't feel trapped in the way I'm writing. I still very much have laced a lot of my music uh, absolutely with the gospel message. In fact, the mm-hmm. opening lines of Unparalyzed, the earth give the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. That is a psalm. Yes. That's a, that's absolutely a biblical psalm. Uh, every song that I've written, lyrics I have, have Bible verses in them. So there's absolutely the ways in which I'm trying to get across what I believe to um, to an audience that may not believe what I believe, may have animosity towards what I believe, but I believe everybody has some form of eternity in them. And I want to speak to that. So I'm not, I'm definitely not trying to ever push a narrative on anybody or or push a, push an agenda on anybody. Um, But I want to make sure that Christ is spoken through the music and what I do. And will there come a time in my career where the kind of music I write might be based on my own uh, surmising that I write more worship centric music, maybe so. But right now, the demographic I'm working with and the music that I'm writing, I'm wanting to make sure that my character is never compromised. I want to make sure that the gospel message is presented in some form that they hear that they can understand and not be put off by, have any animosity towards. Um, and write the music, yeah, that people can enjoy in that way. So, but great question. There's a lot there. Yeah. I, I spoke a long time, but you you really <laughs> opened up a, a good can right there that that yeah. crack open. We'll see what we'll see if anyone responds to me that may know more than me because I do not claim authority on that topic. That's just my anecdotal observation. Right. I think it definitely works though because I have a obvi- I obviously cover Christian music. I cover secular music. Right, and so I cover both ends of the spectrum, and I have a lot of friends. I talked to Danny Goki about this the other day. Yeah, I have yeah. A lot of friend, he's oh my god, he's yeah. awesome. Um, I have a lot of friends who aren't believers, but they love Christian rock because it's mm-hmm. just good music. Right, I've right. had non-believer friends go to Winter Jam with me specifically to see Red or Skillet or TFK or right, Disciple, right. and they don't know the other bands. They go specifically for those, and then they hear the message and they see right, right. The other artists, and it's really cool. Um, sure. I really feel like Christian rock is being used in a way right now that it's never been used before. Mm. Um, one of those artists that you worked with, you talked about is manifest mm-hmm. devil mm-hmm. audience. What was it like working with Chris? Cause Chris has always been a really cool dude. Yeah. So that was very much like a lot of the music with unparalyzed with like with unparalyzed, everything's been very fast. Um, sure. And working with manifest in particular was somewhat of a challenge, not going to lie. Um, because when we, when we're, when we set out to writing my album, we moved pretty quick. We composed yeah. a lot of music, made a lot of arrangements and we're very happy with the direction the album was going. And, and then when we got an opportunity to work with several incredible artists, um, Lacey manifest Trevor, we didn't pivot, but we added on to what we were already doing. <clears throat> you know, we, mm-hmm. we, we're like, okay, well, let's. Uh, can we can we take any of the songs we've written, and work and and work in these these collaborative opportunities, sure. these features, and manifest in particular. Um, was was very like I want to make sure that the song I'm on works with what I want and what my audience would expect of me. Hmm. So we had to from the ground up. We sent him two songs, and he was not. He was like, I think I think we can do something better. I think we have a better song that we can make. And so we had to come up with a new song when working with Manifest. The songs that we had had written previously were not we're not cutting it. So it was you know, it was cool, but I would not be lying if I got to a point where I was like, yo, dude, like. (laughs) Come on, these songs are good, man. Like we got some good stuff here. I, I've listened to your stuff. I I went through your catalog just to make sure I did my, did my due know? diligence. But, man, 
But ultimately, ultimately, for all my hemming and hawing, the song that we came up with and came out of it was really great. And the conversations yeah. I had with Manifest were fantastic. A great guy and a great lyricist. And we just enjoyed the whole process. It came together uh, fast and furious. The video we made for it looks super sick. And I've been very happy with the response that people have had yeah. for it. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was all good. Everything's been all good, you know, yeah. even in any sort of a pushing and pulling and compromising or trying to listen and understand people's desires for songs for songwriting because ultimately people are still artists you know yeah. this is sort of our art this is what we feel like is our gifting and part of that gifting comes with an understanding that you have to be humble and we have to be mm -hmm. we have to practice humility pride may be our greatest sin as artists that feel like we're gift we are our gifting is being an artist yeah is keeping that in check. And this has been definitely a, a flexing of that muscle or working out of that muscle throughout the process. And it's been, it's been well worth it, but yeah, that's how it was working. At the time of this recording, we are literally one day away from the music video from paralyzed mm -hmm. being released. Yep. Rick, you set me up with an interview the day before the music video came out. Come on, man. Um, <laughs> Dude, how excited are you for the video to come out? I haven't seen it yet, but the video right. for Never Back Down is really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about the video for Unparalyzed. The video for Unparalyzed is, uh, was directed by an individual named Circus Head, who is an animator, um, visual effects artist, um, extraordinaire, does an incredible job working with a lot of things. He also happened to uh, take the footage that we had had for Never Back Down and – retrofitted that to his style so he was the nice. he, like i said he he wasn't the director of never back down but he had right. he came in with the footage came in with everything that we gave him and made something really special out of it so this one he had a lot of control over um and trevor and i in our respective locations because i'm in texas right. um and in our respective locations we found our green screens found our shooting and everything and he gave us a shot list of everything he wanted from us so we got our outfits. We got our whole fits. We're trying to look cool, which is like, it feels weird to me when you're working with somebody who's like, pardon me, you think is extremely cool. And then you're there and you're like, Hey, I'm, I'm cool. Yeah. Like rock on everybody. Like you just don't have the same allure, if you will, yeah. as someone like Trevor. And you're just trying not to look like too much of a dork. Uh, but so I, so we recorded all the stuff. We got the shot list. We got our, we got our respective uh, cameramen and, and people we worked with and hammered out some really cool looking footage. And we just got back in the final today and the story that's throughout it, the pieces that he made, the visual effects in it, how we used our footage. It's so, so cool. It feels very old school. You're going to feel like you okay. might be watching like a Meteora Lincoln Park video. It's that oh. kind of aesthetic. Um, it's really, it's really cool. It's a throwback. I, I like nice. it. It speaks to the, speaks to my childhood. Uh, so I'm really stoked about it. And the song's great, obviously, but the the, the music yeah. video works perfectly with it. So I'm really stoked nice. for everybody to see it tomorrow. I can't wait to see it tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Tomorrow, right? Uh, I know. Uh, Listen, I would be, if it was my original music, and as in like completely, I didn't have a label, I'd be throwing that out to everybody who right. asked. I don't, I don't care, but I have a label and they have desires. Promotion, there. man. Marketing and promotion, man. Yes, um, that is how it is. But I would be, I'd be sending it to people. Like, I, right? I, I can't, baby. You know, I look through your YouTube channel extensively. You do a lot of covers. I do. I do. And I've, I've, I've got to give you a thank you. My, my three-year-old daughter, her favorite movie is Encanto. I yeah. almost had, we don't talk about Bruno out of my head until today. So I'm thank sorry. you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It says through gritted teeth. Thank you so much <laughs> for bringing that back. How much so time does it take? I get to listen to that song more. <laughs> Every night when she wakes up at three in the morning, that's what gets her back to sleep is Encanto. I've seen that movie 10 million times. Like that's her How movie. Interesting. Uh, How but, interesting. But doing those, those covers, making the music, doing the video, even the, even the rock covers of the pop songs, like toxic. Mm. How much time does it take to put the song together, make the song, make the video and get it out there? Like they're intricate, complex videos. And right. Right. First off, freaking amazing job on all of those thank like, you so good appreciate um, it what made you want to start doing that and then yeah how long does it take to really get it all done 
You know, it's funny. I talked about Judge and Jerry working with the label and how everything's been really fast. Like Trevor McNeven, Manifest, Lacey, all of these songs coalesce super quick. My job, my career on YouTube really prepped me for how fast we're going here because okay. YouTube is a weekly, bi-weekly yeah. scheduled thing. Like you have yeah. to have your stuff out. You can take a hiatus, but this kind of a job's like a no guarantees thing. You know, how relevant your relevancy is often dependent on your availability. So mm -hmm. you're trying to get content out frequently. So I always said I, I my joke is I hate I hated group projects in school. In high school and middle school, I hated it. I couldn't stand yeah. it. Not because I was bad, but because I just couldn't trust anybody else to do their part. Yes. And then yes. you get there on the day and you're like, all right, did we all do it? And there's always that one dude who's like, um, what? And it's like I I was on, that man. guy. I was that guy. I'm sorry now. Thanks, Reggie. Appreciate the last it. Twenty years. I'm sorry. Appreciate it, dude. Thanks. <laughs> really glad. Really happy about it. Still not bitter about that C we made because somebody forgot their part. Anyway, it got lost. The joke is my entire career now is a group project. Every waking moment of my job is a group project. Um, I work with incredible producers, incredible engineers, incredible instrumentalists, um, incredible artists, and. They were all on the same page. I've been doing this professionally. I'm in air quotes for anyone not watching. Uh, I'm doing this professionally for eight plus years. And at this point, we have a rhythm and a flow to how we work and we understand each other. So yeah. when I ask, you brought up Toxic from Britney Spears, a, a sure. very, very popular pop song. When I ask an instrumentalist I've worked with for years and years and I say, hey, I'm looking for a, a heavy metal composition uh, similar to this example and I'll send over an example. You think you can knock that out? And they go, oh yeah, 100%, I can do that. And, and they're incredible. Shout out to Trey, they're a freaking champ. Yeah. Um, but we that's about kind of the rhythm. like. I can ask a lot. I mean, initially we had to feel each other out and understand what our interests were, what are what were what were they wanting from their careers, what was I wanting from my career. And once we got that rolling and we realized that we could rely on each other for consistency, especially in a in a career like YouTube where consistency is extremely important. And mm -hmm. if you're trying to have a living doing this, especially with the contractors that I work with, essentially, they need lots of work. They need different kinds of work from many different people. They're going to rely on me to be consistent. So it's absolutely a team effort. I, I, have, I have pretty good input on the compositions of these songs, the arrangements, if you will. But I would be lying if I didn't say that each, each instrumentalist, producer, engineer, artist, whatever they may be that I work with, does not put their indelible stamp on the work too because I want to champion other artists in the work I do, especially on YouTube. I want to yeah. make sure that their careers are championed and what they do and represent all different kinds of people. So I'm, I'm very proud of the work that I've done on my YouTube and I'm very proud of the company I keep. So yeah. I, I, my YouTube career means a lot to me. And I hope that people continue to listen to the work I do there. But also I've seen a lot of people uh, cross over, if you will, to use an old radio term, cross over to my CCM work, even if they themselves are not Christian. I've mm -hmm. really appreciated the enthusiasm that a portion of my audience has had for the work I've done with Judge and Jury and this album coming out. It's been great. What what made you want to go down the down the YouTube route with the covers and not just the covers, but the content that you do? Right. Right, right. I, well, like I said, I grew up around two very musical theater parents. My dad is a songwriter, tried to make it in LA in his 20s. It didn't work for him. Um, he went with my mom down there and they did it for about three years and it just didn't, it just didn't manifest. It didn't pan out. Um, but they, you know, when you grow up around that, when you grow up around those kinds of people, very artsy yeah. people, it's just a bug that gets in you. The performer bug is what I call it gets in you. And then you want a stage, you want a spotlight, you want to be seen. And when the advent of technology happened, because I'm a millennial, 30, 32 years old, that was the opportunity. That was the stage. And whenever I was on Google video before YouTube ever came out, my brother and I were working on live an older brother and we were doing all kinds of like silly videos back in the home videos, if you will. And then we got, right. we love video games. And then we found a way to capture our video games. And we made this uh, video type of medium called machinima. And we made a ton of that. And then whenever it came, I started to love singing a lot. I started to find my voice. I made my own YouTube channel that I currently am on. 
and made that back in 2011. And I started mm -hmm. periodically making covers of my favorite songs. It included everything from Slipknot to Reliant K. So nice. I did all kinds of stuff. And uh, that's essentially how it started. It just was around a bunch of creative people, the environment I was in, the family I was in. Uh, I had a lot of creative friends that, at my church that I went to growing up. And they're in a lot of my videos <laughs> and it's, it's very about the older stuff. Um, right. but yeah, that's essentially how it started. I was in sports production for years nice. before the YouTube actually took off. Yeah. I was still doing YouTube all the way through it. And I was in sports production in college. And then I had that, I had a viral hit happen in 2014, uh, with let it go from Disney's frozen. And then I just took it and ran with it. You know, there's nice. plenty of details within there, but took it and ran with it. And essentially right. a career came out of that moment. But, uh, right. Yeah, that's essentially how it started. How long did it take you to really perfect your vocal range and your vocal style and find the range and the style that worked best for you, that was the most comfortable and, and sounded the best? Right, right. You know, and that's a that's an ongoing process, truly. Okay. I think any vocalist would tell you that they're still, they're still, air quotes, they're still finding their voice. It's never... Like I know how I sound and I know what I like. I know I know the parts of my voice that I like. I'm like a Broadway metal vocalist. That's what everyone has said for a long That's time. That's a good way to put it. I feel that way. I, I got I have theatrics behind my voice, but I also have some grittiness to what I do. Um, that's partially because I grew up around musical theater parents, mm -hmm. and then my middle school, high school years were around people who listened to corn and slipknot and metallica. So nice. I just that's what I grew up around. So those two, you know, coalesce. I'm listening to Phantom of the Opera while I'm also spinning Megadeth. So you can't avoid, you can't avoid what this is. This is the product of that. Yeah. Um, and I like that part of my voice, but there's a lot I've learned over the past decade of singing a lot and eight years of doing it professionally that I still, there's still so much of my voice that I haven't explored. My range is, it could go in any different direction. I could have it go higher if I wanted to. I, I really want to expand my lower range, but there's so much I don't know through on and off of vocal lessons that I've taken over the years because I have such a terrible job at sticking to anything. Uh, they, there's, they have all said your voice could do more. They've all been, they've all said you have a great voice. There's something, there's something really magical here, but you've not done near what you could do. And that's still true. I believe them. I believe them through years of not believing and doubting that. So I, I trust their judgment on that. And right. I would love to do more. And I wish I could be a better example for people to, to like, Hey, always, you know, never stop growing, never stop learning, especially when it comes to the arts, especially when it comes to music, whether it's singing or playing an instrument, if you're a writer, if you're a painter, if you're a photographer, whatever you might be, I don't want to, I, I wish I was a better poster child for learning and growing and adapting. I'm not, I'm so easily content with where I am and I get real stagnant. Um, the only thing I can be for people is like, be better than me, please, please be better than me. Please understand that there is greater joy to be had in exploring the giftings you have and the giftings you want to pursue than a career in it can give you. And there's something really pure about that, that the world can't touch when you explore your giftings and see them to great, see them to their fruition and pursue excellence in it. Don't be like me stuck in it and shooting for the middle and shooting for the absolute middle of the road. Aim higher. It's a greater pursuit, truly. And if you shoot as high as you can go, the worst that could happen is it doesn't work out or you get told no and you're in the same place you were. But I've noticed if you never take that shot, you never know if you would have gotten that or gotten there. And you would be amazed with what can happen. If you it's actually true. just go for it. You know? It's so true. That's, that's very, that's very the, true. That's the And day. I try to tell I try to tell people to watch what I do because on YouTube, part of the content I make and I stream and I talk to people my age, people younger. And I, I really do try to stress that because because content creation uh, music in this way has been it's it's not a it's not an oversaturated market in a traditional sense but there are a lot of people vying for eyes and the way the algorithm works throughout social media is you can be the flavor of the month uh for a month and then you moved on from and then your shadow band air quotes again or or what have you whatever term people want to come up with the the greater pursuit now 
is just trying to do your absolute best and do something with excellence because it's good. It's the good and right thing to do to take the giftings you have or the giftings you want to pursue and do them with excellence. If they don't result in a career that you've pursued, that does not take away from how excellent and good and right the thing that you are doing is. And there's great joy to be had in the pursuit of that. And that's something I wish I had because now I'm sort of stuck in the cycle of just making everything all the time. I'm constantly yeah. creating and I'm not yeah. really doing a lot of learning uh, nowadays. I'm really right. caught in a cycle of things. I really wish I could learn more about my voice and do more with yeah. it, but I feel like I'm kind of here. Maybe I'll take a break at one point. I don't know. But right now, the cycle that I'm in is this, constantly mm -hmm. doing, constantly producing. Same. And constantly writing. So if you are looking to get into it, take that time now to understand how wonderful it is to have the gifting and the pursuit of it and make it excellent. That's what I would say. Finally, what can you tell me about the album, man? It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Um, what can you talk about? What can you put out there? Yeah. So they haven't said I can't say anything, so I can I can say whatever I want. Uh, maybe I'll learn after the fact that I shouldn't have said anything. We're about to find out. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but to be fair, nothing I have is is too like uh, explosive. Honestly, uh, maybe I don't know. So, like I said, when we worked with with Lacey and Manifest and, and Trevor, those are things that came along during the writing process of the album. We yeah. had a full album of eleven songs, not done, but composed, arranged, and ready to be recorded. We had lyrics. I had written all a ton of songs. And in collaboration with Jonathan Young, the guy I worked with in Judge and Jury, uh, one of my partners on YouTube as well, and the team, Howard Benson and Neil Sanderson, uh, we had really created some pretty banger music. And I was happy with the album's theme. I was happy with the lyrics and all of that. And then when these collaborations and features started coming along, we didn't pivot, so to speak, but we started including them into the album itself. So... Right. Like uh, Darkness Before the Dawn was a song that that's the one with Lacey. And that was a song that during a writing session that John and I were having, um, that was like the last song of the night. We were we were streaming the whole I don't I, th I think John still has these files. They're not in a broadcast or anything on Twitch. Right. They're not. You can't go find it. But it was the last thing we wrote that night. And I had. Oh, did I just uh, crap my video out? Why did I do that? <laughs> I don't know. Get it back up. And there I am. Hello. Um, it was the, it was the last thing of the night we wrote and I had this, uh, I had this, uh, memo in my phone of this melody and this lyrical lick that I had written and we played it and then John hammered it down on a guitar and a drum pattern and we just put it to the side. And then when the opportunity with Lacey came along, we were like, well, this, if you add some violins to this, you know, this kind of sounds a little close to, to something that Lacey might've done years ago. Um, so then we, you know, presented it. She loved it. We fleshed out the rest of the song and there's darkness before the dawn. Um, but as it relates to the album, to get back to that, we had a whole set of music done, but then when manifest Lacey and Trevor came along, we had to sort of make new music for it and, sure. and then have new music appear in front of us, like with Dustin and unparalyzed new opportunities to write music. So there are songs that are completed for this album. There is enough for a full album right now. That is, ready to be recorded and composed. But these opportunities keep presenting themselves. Right. And we want to make sure those opportunities see the light of day. Yeah. So I would love for the album to come out and be recorded and done by the end of the year. I wouldn't be shocked if it comes out later and we get like two or more features that come out of the woodworks because of the work that we've done with Lacey Manifest and Trevor of Thousand Foot Crutch. Right. And that would be super, super cool. I'm open to all of it. We're open to all of it. Um, but I'm very happy with the album, the songs that we've written. Um, I do think that people will be surprised. This is maybe this is a bit um not spoilery, but maybe like uh, sort of a give not I don't know what the word is. Anyway, thematically, when I knew we were writing an album that was CCM that was going to be uh, geared towards the CCM market, I knew that there were some things and themes and messages that I found important to me in my life that I really wanted to make sure were said. And sure. I want to say them in the similar vein that what we've talked about, about there's worship music and then there's CCM yeah. music. A lot of times you have to, you have to make sure you, you say your words in a certain way to appeal to whichever side you're in. And as it relates to being on the side of CCM, there's things I want to say, but I need to say them in such a way that it fits here. And so I'm very 
proud of the music and the words that we've written for these songs that have not been released and not been finished yet. But what I would say is I think the CCM space is going to be is going to appreciate the challenge that I am presenting to them through this music. And the album is called Darkness Before the Dawn. That is the the title of the album. We had we had some working themes, but we ultimately settled on that. We made some really dope art for it. And uh, I'm really excited for the album to be finished and the story of that album to be told throughout these next uh, five or six songs that we're working on for a full album. That's awesome. But I haven't heard, obviously I've only heard the three singles so far, but I love, right. man, I love everything I've heard so far. And I can be I hard to win it. over when it comes to music I don't know. Um, as we all tend to do when we get into our thirties. So for sure. Absolutely. You know, um, man, it, it's all good. I absolutely love, especially I'm paralyzed, dude. It, it, it's Thank so you, good. It is so no, I'm good. really glad we, we got an opportunity to, yeah. to make that song our own and flesh out the germ of an idea and turn it into something really, really wonderful. So yeah, yeah I'm really proud of it. It is so good, man. I, man, Thanks I can't wait to hear the rest of it when it's ready and when the label yep. will let you send it to people. Um, right, right, right. You know, cannot wait, man. Thank you so much for doing this today. This has been awesome. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.